So the la last talk this morning before our panel discussion is by Kevin Scherr. Uh, Kevin did his uh, training at UCLA, most recently at City of Hope, uh, joined uh, Cedar sinai Samuel Ocean Cancer Center, where he's a medical oncologist uh, with a focus on many cancers, including GU malignancies. Hi, everyone. So as Dr. Figlin said, I'm a medical oncologist here uh, in the urologic oncology group, and my main office is at Tower Oncology, which is just a few blocks away. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, adjuvant therapy and the treatment of renal cell carcinoma today. But before I get started, I just want to make a distinction between localized disease and metastatic disease. So localized disease is disease that is confined solely to the kidney at presentation, whereas metastatic disease refers to disease that has spread beyond the kidney. So when we talk about adjuvant therapy, this only applies for patients who present with localized disease. And the standard of care therapy currently for patients who present with localized disease is surgical intervention with a nephrectomy, followed by routine observation alone and surveillance with frequent CT scans and uh, multiple uh, physician visits and monitoring. Currently, um, there are no therapeutic interventions that are standard of care post-surgical intervention because none to date have proven benefit. However, we're hopeful that this will change in the future as new uh, um, studies are completed and may show that some of these therapies that we've talked about so far today may actually also prove benefit in the adjuvant setting. Okay, so just um, taking a step back, so uh, adjuvant therapy uh, refers to any therapeutic intervention that's delivered after definitive treatment for a cancer. And the goal of adjuvant therapy is to reduce the risk of cancer recurrences. So in kidney cancer, we're talking about the definitive intervention is surgical intervention. And so post-nephrectomy, we can start to think about what treatments do we have available that might help to prevent recurrences. And those include cytotoxic agents, which are traditional chemotherapy drugs, immunotherapy, which are drugs, as you may have heard already, that uh, modulate the immune system. Um, and, and, tar and uh, make your own immune system fight the cancer cells. Um, tyrosine kinase inhibitors, which target specific mutations in the cancer. And vaccines, which you'll hear more about later as well. Um, we do know that adjuvant therapies in general are most effective among higher risk populations. And this makes sense because patients who are at low risk of recurrence are going to receive little benefit from receiving additional therapy after surgical intervention. And as was just discussed, higher risk populations are based on a number of factors, including the size of the tumor, uh, whether nodes are involved, uh, what the tumor looks like under the microscope, as well as the performance status of the patient. Um, so what's the rationale for adjuvant therapy? So once the disease is resected surgically, um, we're, we're never sure that we've gotten all of it, and there may be micrometastatic disease that is still in the body, or even circulating tumor cells. And the goal of adjuvant therapy is to eradicate any remaining disease that isn't grossly visualized. And this concept sort of gained favor in the 70s when scientists discovered um, that uh, under the microscope that the number of viable cells that are undergoing active cell replication are inversely related to the population size. So in other words, in smaller tumors, the cells are more rapidly divided. And all of our known therapies target actively dividing cells. So therefore, treatment may be more effective when you're targeting small volume disease or micrometastatic disease versus large volume disease, <clears throat> which is one of the rationales for adjuvant therapy. Um, we know that adjuvant therapy is successful in other disease types. Um, we've seen survival advantages with the use of adjuvant therapy in uh, other cancers like breast, colon, rectal, 
et cetera. And this is common uh, standard of care practice in these disease types is that after definitive surgical treatment, we still give additional therapy to prevent recurrences. Um, so uh, this slide just looks at, uh, above the, the date are the uh, therapies that are actively, that were actively used in the treatment of metastatic disease. So in the 80s and 90s, IL-2 interferon and then high-dose IL-2 were actively utilized in the metastatic setting. In the 2000s and beyond, we've started to use these tyrosine kinase inhibitors or targeted therapies that actually uh, address uh, specific mutations in the cancer. The reason I, I, and actually one of them is missing at the end, exitinib, which was more recently approved. The reason I show this slide, though, is to point out that as therapies are popularized in the metastatic, are used in the metastatic setting, we then start to evaluate whether these same therapies may be useful in the adjuvant setting. So, when we, we used IL-2 interferon, high-dose IL-2 in the 80s, 90s, and then we started to study uh, in adjuvant clinical trials in the late 90s, early 2000s, whether we can use these immune therapies in the adjuvant setting to help prevent recurrences. The same goes for the targeted agents. So now, um, in 2010 and beyond, we've started uh, clinical trials to utilize these accepted um, uh, therapies in the metastatic setting, now in the adjuvant. Uh, setting. So these are uh, the historical reported adjuvant trials in kidney cancer. There are 14 or so trials. Um, these are the largest ones. And you know, they, they done throughout the uh, late 80s, early 90s, and even into 2000, looking at interferon, high-dose IL-2, um, tumor uh, vaccines, as well as some older chemotherapy agents. And unfortunately, out of these 14 trials, 13 of them were negative, um, meaning that none of them showed benefit uh, for intervention after definitive surgical treatment, um, except for one, which is, if I can figure out how to, let's see, there we go. Uh, in 2004, this autologous tumor vaccine trial uh, was positive and showed a progression-free survival advantage for patients in the adjuvant setting. So I'm going to talk about this trial in a little bit more depth. So um, <clears throat> they enrolled uh, about 560 patients throughout Germany, 55 sites in Germany, and they looked at patients who had tumors that were greater than two and a half centimeters, um, that's an older staging system, or who had uh, node positivity. And these patients were randomized before they underwent surgery. They were randomized to either receive the vaccine um, or receive no treatment. Each of these patients received, the ones that got the vaccine, got six intradermal applications of the vaccine at four-week intervals. And 177 patients ended up receiving the vaccine. And this is an autologous vaccine, so it's prepared from the patient's actual tumor. Um, it's the specimen is harvested, the vaccine is created, and then uh, the vaccine is delivered to the patient with the goal towards uh, priming the immune system to fight the cancer cells. And so as I mentioned, this was a positive trial, um, and it showed at the five-year mark, in patients who received the vaccine, 77.4% of the patients who received the vaccine uh, were alive without disease versus 67.8% of patients who did not receive the vaccine. So this was statistically significant, and it showed that, there, that this vaccine was helpful in preventing recurrences. Unfortunately, the vaccine um, was difficult, very difficult to prepare and, and cost prohibitive, and so no further work has been done with this particular vaccine. Although uh, there are multiple clinical trials underway now in the metastatic setting using vaccines, and hopefully if they prove benefit in the metastatic setting, we'll again see trials in the adjuvant setting with other vaccines. So this turns to the, to the trials that are currently underway in the adjuvant setting, and there are six major trials. All of these trials are utilizing different agents they're utilizing different periods of treatment time. So some are looking at one year, some are looking at three year. 
and others also, uh, or excuse me, they all also have slightly different inclusion criteria. So while they're all hoping to enroll higher risk patients, as those are the patients where we think we can uh, affect the most change, they, their, the eligi eligibility criteria are all slightly different. So we'll have difficulty interpreting the data when it all comes to fruition. So the, oops, the ASSURE trial, um, the ASSURE trial is looking at Sutent versus Serafinib versus placebo, um, all for one year of therapy. The ATLAS trial is Exitinib versus placebo for three years. The s track trial, Sutent versus placebo for a year. The Everest trial is Everolimus for a year versus placebo. That trial is interesting because it's the only one of this group that's looking at the mTOR inhibitor class of drugs, whereas the other drugs are all looking at uh, VEGF pathway inhibitors. The PROTECT trial is looking at pizopinib for a year versus placebo. And the SOURCE trial, serafinib for a year versus serafinib for three years versus uh, placebo. And as you see, so three of these are no longer recruiting. Um, three are still recruiting. And the Everest trial is underway here at Cedars, and we are a participant still enrolling patients in, in that trial. Um, the two on the corners are the ones that are most likely to present results sooner. Um, and I, I believe Assure hopefully should report uh, some conclusions later this year. So I'm just going to talk a bit about the Everest trial real quickly because that's the trial that we have underway here. So um, this is looking at patients who are, as I said, higher risk patients, so intermediate high risk group or very high risk group. And that's based on the size of the tumors as well as the grade of the tumor under the microscope. Um, and patients uh, undergo nephrectomy. They're stratified based on pathologic stage, histologic subtype, and performance status and then randomized to either receive Everolimus for one year, 54 weeks, or placebo. And the follow-up on this trial is uh, 10 years. So estimated enrollment is about 1,200 patients. Um, the study was started in April of 2011, uh, will complete in October 2021, hopefully, and as I said, it's open here at Cedars. So once we have the results of all these trials, it will likely be a challenge interpreting all of these results. Um, and we can imagine three scenarios of, of, in terms of the results. Potentially, all of the trials will be positive, all will be negative, or more likely, there will be heterogeneous results. And so if all are, oops, if all are positive or heterogeneous results, we'll be left with trying to understand how do we prioritize these agents? Which agent might be better for each individual? And it will also become a question, if we use one of these agents in the adjuvant setting, if the patient progresses and becomes metastatic, we will have a question as to whether we go back to the initial drug or we try a different drug or try a different class of drug. So these are all questions that will arise as these results come in. The other question will be about duration of therapy. So while some of the trials are looking at a year versus three years, depending upon the results, we may be left wondering, is a year better than three? Do we really know if that's true? So that's another issue that we will have to think about. And also patient selection. As I mentioned, all the trials attempt to enroll higher risk patients, but the inclusion criteria are slightly different. And so we'll really have to parse the data when it comes back, especially if there are heterogeneous results, to try and understand which subtypes or which classifications of patients actually received benefit. If the trials are all negative, um, there are other approaches that are still uh, underway and being considered, such as moving vaccine trials into the adjuvant setting, starting to think about using the newer immunomodulating agents, as well as potentially identifying targetable mutations in an individual's tumor. So after resection, we might be able to identify a marker in the blood or in the tumor that might show us that one of these drugs may be better than another for a particular patient. 
So in, in conclusion, um, there's no current standard of care treatment post-nephrectomy, so no adjuvant treatment currently. Um, historical trials, as I said, have yielded negative results um, for interferon, IL-2, chemotherapy, with the exception of the vaccine trial that I discussed. However, newer trials are underway, um, examining the role of TKIs, and hopefully we will have some new data within the next few years uh, to help guide our, our treatment decisions. And the treatment paradigm may drastically change in the next years as this trial data is published. And again, newer agents on the, are on the horizon to add to our adjuvant armamentarium. That's it. Thank you.